All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the quick administrative announcements. Um, so homework one is due at eight. Homework two is due um, next Tuesday, also at eight. Um, only two problems on this one. Um, plus an extra credit problem, which will rely on things that you'll see in the lecture today. Okay, if you actually want the extra credit. Um, so, um, I haven't gotten any emails yet saying uh, the, the, the submission logistics aren't working. Um, so I think everything is okay. Uh, there were a couple of minor hiccups with the submissions for homework zero. Um, some people have managed to say things as drafts that weren't actually um, formally submitted by Moodle when the deadline came, but we can see the draft and so we'll just grade the draft as if you had submitted it. Um, uh, I don't think there are any other administrative things that we need to worry about. Oh, right. Somebody asked about um, conflict exams because we do have um, a midterm coming up in the not too distant future. Um, there will be a conflict exam um, with a class of 130 students. Chances are pretty good that um, if we're conflicting with another class, um, either it's smaller or it's another computer science class. Um, so technically it's the larger of the two that has to have the conflict, but since that is almost always me, I just have a conflict exam. Um, I'll post a web form where you can register your need to take a conflict exam, um, and then I'll try to, and, and the time, propose a few times when you're available. Um, once I've decided, once we've scheduled the conflict exam, I don't actually care whether you take the regular exam or the conflict, um, as long as you tell me far enough in advance that you're coming to the conflict. Um, um, but I'm only going to schedule the conflict to be consistent with the people who actually need it. Right? So if you have another final exam, great. Um, if you have a job interview, move it. The recruiters will wait. They get a bonus for every time somebody actually comes to interview. You don't care. They will wait for you. Um, if somebody calls you and says, oh no, we absolutely have to have this interview this week, they are lying to you. Don't believe them. <laughs> um, all right. So what I want to talk about today is the last, um, this is the, the, the last dynamic programming lecture I want to give. And I want to talk about one last trick for speeding up certain classes of dynamic programming algorithms. Now, unfortunately, there isn't actually time to show you a dynamic programming algorithm using this trick. Um, so at some level, I need you to take my word for something, and then um, you can try to connect the dots in, um, uh, in the homework. But I want to argue that in the core of many dynamic programming algorithms, you have um, some form of some kind of array that is you know typically two dimensional, um, and I need to find 
the minimum of every row in this matrix. Now, this array is not necessarily the memoization table. This is probably some sort of implicitly defined array where often um, it has, you know, something of the following form. This is maybe, you know, the optimal solution that you've computed in the previous um, uh, sorry, that should be a minus one in the previous iteration of the main loop of your of your dynamic programming algorithm, um, plus some other uh, two dimensional array that depends on the parameters of the problem. Okay, so for example. Um, uh, this kind of structure, or this very similar kind of structure, shows up in at least one way of solving either problem one or problem two on the current homework that's due in a few hours. Um, sometimes you see, you know, more than one opt of the previous, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the previous subproblem. Um, you'll see that in problem two. Uh, one example of this is this is essentially the kind of structure that you would see in um, the dynamic programming algorithm for computing shortest paths in a graph, where maybe opt is uh, the length of a path between some pair of vertices that uses at most k minus one edges, and dij is the weight of some edge from i to j. Okay. Um, so buried inside Bellman Ford, I have you know this inside a for loop, um, in particular for all i, for all j, this, and then in, a, in an outer loop um, for all k. And so uh, what you end up doing in the algorithm is discovering in this implicitly defined. Um, matrix, you end up finding the smallest entry in every row. Okay. Now, for lots of dynamic programming algorithms that arise in practice, these two-dimensional arrays that you're searching to find the minimum in every row have an additional special structure. If there's no other, if I just tell you, here's a two-dimensional array, find the minimum element in every row, you cannot do anything smarter than look at every element in the array in order m n time. So, um, you know, brute force, sort of trivial algorithm, runs in uh, m n time. And there's really nothing you can do to beat that. But for a lot of dynamic programming problems, these minimum, the matrix has an additional special structure that allows you to speed up the search. So here's an example of one of these matrices and the, and the special structure that I want to um, uh, uh, exploit here is that I, I'm going to claim this matrix is monotone. And what a monotone matrix means is that the minimum element in later row, in any later row is either in the same column or, or later column than in any row minima in earlier rows. So if I, I've shaded in the, minim, the smallest element in every row of this 5 by 5 matrix, and what you see is as I go down the rows, the, the, the columns in which the, the minimum elements appear either stay the same or move to the right. Okay? Um, come on. Oh, come on. Palm rejection. I can't wait for my pencil to show up. Uh, 
Okay. So the indices of the row minima are non-decreasing. They either stay the same or go up as you get to later and later rows. Um, now, why would this be um, a useful structure to have? Well, um, if somehow, if the rows are independent, then perhaps what you can do is just do the computation as we did for Hirschberg's algorithm. Somehow, let's just find the minimum element in the middle row. Okay. Um, well, here it is, number eight. Um, and then once I've located the, the index of the, the smallest element in the row in the middle, the monotonicity of the array implies that uh, there are certain places in the array where the other row minima can't be. So um, in any earlier rows, the row minima have to be either in the same column or further to the left. And in any later rows, the, uh, the row minima either have to be in the same column or further to the right. And so, at least in principle, it looks like you have the basis for some kind of divide and conquer algorithm. And, um, this turns out, for, for some subtle reasons, not to quite work as well as you'd hope. Um, so in particular, if all of the row minima are over here on the left, um, well, that actually isn't so bad. Good up with something like n log n in that case. Um, there are circumstances, though, where... Why doesn't... I'm sorry? Diagonal. If the minimum is diagonal, if the minimum lie along diagonal, then this is a perfect divide and conquer algorithm. Okay. I find the one in the middle, and then I have half as many rows and columns up there, half as many rows and columns down there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, let me actually glance at my notes to see why this doesn't actually work all the time. Um, well, in fact, it does. But let's see what the running time of this algorithm would be. And so this is fine. So I can find find the find the min of the middle row, and then recurse in the upper left and lower right quadrants. Okay? Um, so if this is a row with M, <coughs> sorry, if this is a matrix with M columns and N rows, sorry, M rows and N columns, it takes order N time to find the middle entry, the minimum entry in the the middle row, assuming that I can access every entry in this matrix in constant time. Um, if this is something that either, if it's defined, you know, sort of implicitly by some sort of recurrence, I'm assuming that that, that opt is a table lookup that I can find somewhere, and this this D is a different table lookup that I can find somewhere. And so even though this matrix is defined only implicitly. I can still access any entry in the matrix in constant time if I want to. So I can just do a brute force scan of this middle row. Um, and then I need to recurse on the two subproblems. And so I have, well, I should have said this is M and that the other one is N, just to be. Uh, I'll uh, ignore some floors and ceilings and minus ones here. So I get a, a, a recurrence that looks very much like the divide and conquer recurrence for Hirschberg's algorithm. 
Um, so if I actually solve this recurrence all the way down to the ground, um, this turns out to be order m plus n log m. Um, now this takes a, a small amount of work to prove, um, which I'm not going to go through. It's in the notes. Intuitively, the um, you get a binary recursion tree where at every level of the recursion tree you're doing order n work. <coughs> and because the recursion tree is balanced, because you're always dividing m by 2, the depth of the recursion tree is log m. That's what gives you the n log m. But then for every recursive call, you have a small amount of overhead that you have to deal with. And so you get this extra additive, additive order m term. You have to do a constant amount of work in every column, in every row, um, no matter what. Okay. This is really to handle the case where the array is, is, is very tall and skinny. Um, uh, say if there's only a, a one column left in the recursive subproblem, you just scan it. Um, that's where this order in term comes from. So what this means is that if you have a, a dynamic programming algorithm based on some sort of monotone array, that you can replace the brute force quadratic scan of that array with a slightly more complicated near linear time um, evaluation of that array. Um, and so this means, for example, um, in uh, there's an algorithm in the lecture notes, which I didn't have time to talk about, where uh, you want to compute the best possible binary search tree for a given set of n keys. Uh, so you imagine that you have n, uh, uh, a set of n keys that you want to search for later. You know somehow in advance how many times you're going to look for each of these items. And so you want to arrange your binary search tree so that the more frequent items are shallower in the tree and the less frequent items are deeper in the tree. You don't necessarily just want to build a perfectly balanced um, binary search tree. So if, for example, you are you know, trying to build an index for the dictionary in the library of the high school that I went to, you want the word sex to be relatively shallow in the tree, and the word mesothelioma can be really, really deep. Okay. Um, and so there's a, there's a recurrence, the divide and conquer recurrence, which gives you a dynamic programming algorithm that runs in n cubed time. If I substitute this divide and conquer algorithm in place of the two inner loops, you can reduce the running time of the algorithm almost immediately to n squared, n squared log n. Okay, because I'm replacing something quadratic with something near linear. Um, but interestingly, under other conditions, even stricter than monotonicity, that actually arise in practice, in particular in this binary search tree problem, um, I can even get rid of this log n factor and get an algorithm that is strictly linear. There's a question back there. Oh, so if you imagine, for example, that... Um, I'm trying to give a, a meta example rather than an actual concrete example here. So, um, so let me take um, let's suppose I'm trying to figure out in the kth iteration of, of Belden Ford I'm trying to figure out the minimum distance to vertex i that uses at most k edges from the source. Okay. Now, opt of j comma k minus 1 in this case is the minimum distance to vertex j that uses at most k minus 1 edges. 
And then d of ij is the length of the edge from j to i. Okay, so this is a candidate for the shortest path to vertex i that uses at most k edges. Now, there are lots of choices for what j is. And in the inner loop of my algorithm, I'm going to um, loop over all i and then all j. So in the, inner, the two inner loops of my algorithm, I'm really scanning a matrix of this form. And then the outer loop, I'll consider k in increasing order up to b minus 1. Ah, so if it just so happens, if you, I mean, so this is, this is the secret. If you know that the distances in your graph satisfy certain properties that I'm going to get to in a second, that will imply that this matrix that you've built is monotone, and you can do this cost saving. It's a little bit tricky. I can't say exactly what it means. There, I have to restrict what from totally mon, monotone matrices to totally monotone matrices to something called Monge matrices. Once I'm down to the level of Monge matrices, um, it'll be easy to sort of show you where that property comes from in this context. Okay. All right. So I would like to get rid of this log factor. Um, so I need to define a stronger property. Um, so I'm going to say that um, an array M is totally monotone. Um, if every two by two submatrix is monotone. Ah, come on. All right. Now, when I say two by two submatrix, I don't mean two consecutive rows and two consecutive columns. I mean, pick any two rows and any two columns, and that defines four entries in the, in the, uh, in the array. And I require that that two by two matrix is monotone. So um, here is the array that I showed you earlier that I claimed was monotone. And if you look at, um, let me pick it color that actually shows up here. If you look at these four entries, um, you can see that this matrix is not totally monotone because this two by two matrix, the minima go the wrong way. 27 is smaller than 38, but 25 is smaller than 71. Okay, so this matrix is monotone but not totally monotone. And if I tweak the matrix a little bit, so in fact I only changed those four entries, everything else should, I believe, be identical, um, this new matrix, in fact, is totally monotone. Okay. Did I screw something up? The eight in the third row. The eight in the third row versus what? Do you see something that where I screwed this up? Wait, can you say that again? Every two by two, every two by two matrix is um, monotone, meaning the minimum on the top cannot be to the right, and the minimum on the bottom to the left which is what the pattern that you're seeing, the, the pattern that you see up there at the top, that's illegal and totally monotone matrix. Okay. Um, now verifying this requires, unfortunately, checking every pair of rows and every pair of columns. It's, a, it's an ugly, slow, and tedious process. 
Sorry, isn't that three by three? Like, can you explain that again? Circle numbers? No. There are two rows and two columns that have circled numbers in them. That's a two by two matrix. 38, 27, 25, 71. In the middle, does it count? The row in the middle doesn't count. Okay. Only pick out rows one and three and columns three and five. Yes? Is that property if and only if? Or just one? That is the definition of totally monotone. Okay, yeah. So it's an if and only if. Okay? So um, I, uh, I want to give a, a, a different characterization of the divide and conquer algorithm that you just saw, but the one that only really works when the matrix is totally monotone. Um, so let me take my totally monotone matrix, and I want to find the minimum element in every row. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out every other row and I'm going to define a smaller matrix which is totally monotone. If I, t if I pick anything in a part of a I see you. <laughs> if I pick any part of a, of a, of a totally monotone matrix, so I throw out a row, it's still totally monotone. If I throw out a column, it's still totally monotone. Okay, there was a question over here. Yes? So, why do you split the I'm sorry? Why do you split Because I needed a counterexample, and there it was. I want to show you that this array is not sorted. I just have to point at two things and notice that they're out of order. I just need one example. I picked that example because it worked. No, no other reason. Okay, so um, I'm going to pick out the um, you know the minimum the minimum en entries in uh, the the rows of the smaller matrix, and then I'm going to lift them back up to the original matrix, the original array. Okay, and now I can observe that because I know where all the row minima and the even rows are, I actually know something about where the row minima in the odd rows have to be. Namely, um, they have to be in sort of in between the 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 even minima. Okay. Okay, so now if I want to find the minima in each of these odd rows, I really only have to walk down this staircase. I scan, in this case, the first two entries in row one, then I jump down and scan the next three entries in row three, then I jump down, I don't have to do any work in row five at all, because there's only one index that works. And I jump down, I scan the next six entries in row seven, um, and then I'm done. And so the, the, the scanning, the scanning part of this um, only takes order m plus n time. Because I, I, I traverse each row and I might have to visit each column once. Um, and so I get something that, that looks like this. m over 2n plus order mn. Um, and if I've done this correctly, the M terms are going to define a descending geometric series. So at the top level, I do M plus N. At the next level down, I do M over 2 plus N. At the next level down, I do N, M over 4 plus N. And so once again, um, because I, I recurse log M levels deep, um, I'm going to end up with m plus n log m. This is exactly the same running time that I got previously. Um, and in fact, it's really the same algorithm. Um, you can see a kind of isomorphism between these two algorithms by imagining you know, this divide and conquer algorithm gives you a binary um, recursion tree, which I explore by depth first search. That's what recursion does. Whereas this divide and conquer algorithm, 
I'm essentially doing a breadth first traversal of the same recursion tree. Um, I'm looking at all of the leaves, and then I'm looking at all of the parents of the leaves, and then I'm looking at all of the grandparents of the leaves, and so on. Uh, uh, actually, no. I'm looking at the root, then the children of the root. And the very last step, this staircase, is I'm filling in the leaves um, of that divide and conquer tree, search tree. Yes? On this one? Okay, so this array is totally monotone. So if I delete some of the rows, the resulting array is still totally monotone because all the two by two submatrices in this smaller array are also two by two submatrices in the original array. So I recursively find the smallest element in each row in the smaller array. And, okay, and it tells me up at the top where the smallest elements in those even rows are. And then because the, the, the array at the top is monotone, I know, for example, that the minimum element in this last row has to be between the minimum of the row above and, and the row below. So I only have to scan this chunk of that row. And altogether, if I walk down this staircase, um, at every step, I'm either going to visit a new row or I'm going to visit a new column. And so the, the total number of cells that I visit along this pink staircase is at most n plus n. And so that, that gives me the running time recurrence. And then I get the running time. Yeah. Uh, on the third page, in the recursion. This page? Yeah, is it uh, 3M or 2 on the second T? I'm sorry? Um, on the second T, is it 3M or 2 instead of M or 2? No. Oh, okay. I have M over 2 rows in the top half, and I have M over 2 rows in the bottom half. Oh, okay. I'm just in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why does it have to be total? Um, the, where, the, the place where I use total monotonicity is in the argument. I say, well, I deleted the rows, and I got a solar submatrix and therefore it's totally monotone, but in fact, I never really use totally here. If, if the matrix is monotone, then deleting any subset of the rows, I'll still get something monotone. Okay. Um, okay. But, there's um, another trick that I can use. Um, this is a, a trick that was discovered by four researchers whose initials are um, S-M-A-W-K. Um, Alok Agarwal, Maria Clave, Shlomo Moran, Peter Shore, and Robert Wilbur. Um, this is the smoke algorithm. And um, the smoke algorithm gets rid of that annoying log factor, but it really does require the matrix is totally, totally monotone. Um, and the way it does it, actually, I don't really need this page.